Now I'm crying. <laughs> this was not the show we were planning <laughs> I didn't on making. That. I didn't know <laughs> this was, was going to be a funny episode. Nope, this is the sad one. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't done a sad one yet. Would you believe what it takes to make a hit Disney Channel show? Hi, everyone. I am your host, Rebecca Rogers. I am so happy you guys are here today, and I am so happy to introduce to you my wonderful friend, Dan Povenmeyer. Hi, Dan. Hey, how are you how are doing? You? I'm doing great. Thank you. So why don't you tell everyone, besides being the creator of the Minions, <clears throat> what is it that you I do? I did not create the Minions. He's so humble. He's <laughs> such a humble individual, if you know, you know. Kara has gotten to you. See. <laughs> Always. <Yes. laughs> So, Dan, what is it that you do? Uh, I uh, well, I do a lot of things, but, you do but a the, lot. the 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 main thing is that I uh, create cartoon shows. Any in and, part in particular, and then run those shows. Uh, I was the creator of uh, Phineas and Ferb on on Disney Channel. My I, was, I, was, I was the co-creator. Me, me and my buddy Swampy made that show, and and then within that show, I wrote songs and and drew storyboards and directed and uh and and wrote and uh acted I, i'm one of the the characters Doctor i do the voice of dr doofenshmirtz <laughs> when he talks it's my voice that comes out of his face and uh uh so you know i i just wore a lot of hats on that show because swampy and i sort of made the show as we would if we were making it in our garage and, I love uh, it. And, and I met Vanessa at your house. Yes, you met, you met, you, daughter. Yes, you met Olivia. She, she looks just like her character, and I love everything about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. The, the characters. <laughs> uh, it's funny because that character was not supposed to be her, but once we decided to make it. Uh, that character was drawn by one of the board artists as like a, a henchwoman for, for Doofenshmirtz. Oh. And we liked the design so much, but I said, but I don't think he is successful enough to <laughs> to hire hench people. What do you mean? He's I don't know how much enough? henching he has t uh, to do. And, uh, and, and I said, but it would be really funny if we think it's his he henchwoman. And then at the end, we realize it's his teenage daughter <laughs> and, and, and that he's divorced. And, Who just you know, trolls and, him yes, and, and, and he's got her for the weekend. And so she's there. And so... Uh, so, Dan, he's yeah, he's successful funny. enough to have a whole nemesis. Yes, I, I, I guess. <laughs> so he's but he's got to be he's a not little making bit a lot of success. money at it. He's, yes, he's got so. a whole. He's a threatening whole enough to have his own nemesis. Not just a platypus. Yes, it's Perry it's the. Perry the <laughs> So out of the platypus, her, unless he puts the hat on, and then right. parry the platypus. It's completely unrecognizable yes. without the hat. Yes, exactly. So after Phineas and Ferb, did you go to any other new projects? Uh, after Phineas, we did Milo Murphy's Law, which uh, which I'm still very very proud of that show. But it was during a time where Disney uh, Channel decided to put all of their cartoons on uh, Disney XD, which mm -hmm. is sort of their channel. They were they were trying to make it work, and it was just on a place in the dial that people don't, didn't know where it was. So everything <laughs> sort of went there and died a death. Uh, but we got two seasons out of it. And I think it's, it's some of the best work that I've done. And now I'm doing a show called Hamster and Gretel for, uh, for Disney channel. That's so cute. And, uh, and it's really, we're having the best time with it. And, uh, it makes me, uh, it makes me very proud and it's doing, it's, 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 it's doing very well. And my, uh, my daughter Melly is the lead voice on it, and my daughter Alex uh, sings for the for the show periodically. She was doing; uh, th they both got those gigs because they were already doing stuff for me, and I was That's just awesome. using it as as temps. And then eventually, people said, "We should just use this." this yeah, is really this good. is good stuff. Because yeah, I was trying not to to push them, uh, you know, at all. Right, but right. Uh, but the execs were like, "I don't think this is broken. I don't think we need to fix it." Right. Uh, it looks good. It sounds good. Yeah. So so now she's. You know, uh, Melly's the lead on a Disney Channel show. Awesome. Which, and she never wanted to be an actress. She doesn't <laughs> really want to be an actress. She was just, you know, like, it was literally like, hey, honey, can you come in here and write, read some lines for me <laughs> so that, you know, it's not my voice, do, you know, because I was doing a presentation piece. Right, right, right. And, uh, and I had her come in and read the read Gretel's lines, and then she was so funny because she has my sense of humor. Right, she right. grew up with my sense of humor, so she knows when she sees the line written how – it should exactly be said because she yeah. knows, you know, and uh, and she was she just knocked it out of the park, and then we le left her in for the uh, uh, for the pilot and recast everybody else, including me, Ooh. and uh, and then uh, and then it like the character tested really well, and eventually we just ended up like oh, okay, I guess it's 
I love it's her. And I was like, are you ready for this? Would you want to do this? And she's like, yeah, no, it's, it's fun. And she's enjoying it. Yeah, she's enjoying it. She didn't it. want to be an actress before, but now no, she's... No, and she still doesn't really. Okay, you know <laughs> what? Like, Some she people... doesn't mind voice acting. She doesn't ever yeah. want to be in front of a camera. She's, you know... Some people just have different dreams. Yeah. And that's okay. Exactly. She's like, I think I want to be a vet. <laughs> oh, I <laughs> so, love that so sweet. Yeah, or an engineer. She would also like to be she's an She's smart. Yeah, she's, she's, smart she's, kid. she's a smart kid. But did you always want to be... So, like, she does. she's always wanted to do something else. Yeah. Have you always wanted to do Hollywood and this kind of thing? Since I was uh, maybe 12 or 13, uh, I, okay. I saw the movie Jaws, and it changed my life because I suddenly was like... It was so effe- affecting in so many ways and made me feel so many ways. And, and I was just like, oh, my God. And it was such an adventure. And I was like... Right. I was exhausted by the end of it, and I was like, and and realized there's a person. I started reading about Steven Spielberg and realized there's a person whose job it is to make all the decisions, what shots go after each other, where to put the camera, what the pe- people should be saying and doing and stuff, and uh, and I was like, oh. I think I want to do that job. I want to make movies. And so from then on, I just wanted to come to Hollywood and, and uh, make entertainment. So how did you go about that journey? Like, how did you get to be on this couch? Well, I... Other than me texting you and saying, hey, Dan, come to this place. So there's a very small film school at CalArts in, uh, mm-hmm. in Valencia. And I applied there and I played, uh, applied to USC and uh, to the film schools. And the film school at Cal Arts sent me a letter because because I, I I was sort of a child prodigy artist, uh, you know I was ma- making pretty good money do, just doing art when yeah. I was twelve or thirteen, and uh, and the um, and so I I put art in with my portfolio because I want to show them what a what a varied and and uh, you know what a broad spectrum of talents I had, and so I put some of my pen and ink art in there, and uh, and I. And I sent it in, and they said they wrote me a letter and said, "Hey, the film school is very small. We've only got a few a few positions. We're not making that decision for another month or so. But we did show some of your art to the animation school, and they said they will take you right now. Oh wow! Like, like you don't even have to apply; they will just t- 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 take you. And I was like, "That's like the best animation school in the world." Wow! I don't want to go into animation, and I threw that letter away. <laughs> oh my god! And I went to to USC, which also I did not get into the film school at USC either. But I could go there and take uh, film uh, film classes. And so I went there for two years and and uh, and took film classes and just nothing but film classes basically. Still didn't get into the film school. But at a certain point, I started realizing, okay, they've taught me everything. You know that. You know, but by the time I went to USC, I'd made a lot of movies. I'd made a lot of Super 8 movies, Super 8 sound movies. Right. And I understood what I didn't know. I, I knew enough to know the things that I needed to learn. And I felt like I'd learned all of those. And I was still spending a lot of money on, you know, on school at USC. And eventually I just said, I think I'm just going to stop and, and start seeing if I can find work. And so I dropped out. So I'm a cautionary tale. <laughs> so uh, I always tell people, don't, kids, don't stay in school or you could end up like me. Uh, oh, darn. But, uh, oh, no. <laughs> end up like Dan. But it's worked out. It's, it, it, yeah. It, it, it's worked out fine because I knew at the time, um, and, you know, this is what I told my parents. I said, you know, I am never going to do anything for a living that I'm going to need a degree for. Yeah. It's like everything that I could imagine doing for a living uh, was stuff that my work would speak for itself. Yeah. You know, my portfolio, the, you know, what, whatever I was going to do for a living, they were never going to check a diploma. And so it didn't make sense for me to continue to spend so much money for a diploma that Absolutely. was not really part of what I, you know, right. I found necessary for the job. And, uh, and so I, 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 got out of school I, I i was supporting myself with the freelance art gigs through most of that and i did a little bit of like second unit directing on something and uh, a little bit of editing and a little bit of storyboarding and stuff like that and just you know taking whatever work i could get where where wherever and then um and then I answered an ad for a storyboard artist on the Ninja Turtles because I was like, oh, I, I can draw. And I went in and I got that gig and, and started doing that freelance for a while. And eventually, 
uh, you know, I, I worked at that studio for a while and then I had some time where I wasn't making any money at all for like six months. Wow. All my freelance had dried up because I was just working in the studio and then suddenly that show ended and and I and I was like six months I was not making like hardly any money. And I uh, and I started to worry about like running out of money. Yeah. And I was down to like two hundred dollars in the bank or something like that. Oh my god. And uh, and I got and two things happened at the, almost the exact same time. I, I I got hired by The Simpsons to work on a big hit primetime show. Wow. Uh, doing uh, character layout, which is like main poses of animation, and uh, and I got hired to write a low budget slasher movie called Psycho Cop Two: Psycho Cop Returns. Uh, and, uh, and so I went into work every day and learned how to draw in an animation studio and, anima- you know, um, uh, how to actually animate, uh, you know, in a way that I had never had to think about, you know, b- before. And I was just absorbing this and learning how to, how to draw those characters, which are very specific and, uh, and, and how, a, how a big studio works. And then I would come home and I would take, I would, uh, I would have dinner and then I would, uh, uh, go into my office and I would type out 10 pages of a script that I was working on for this slasher movie. Right. And at the end of two weeks, I had a a script that I, that, uh, they, they, they were going to shoot. And, uh, and my friend Adam said, you know, you can, you can, uh, you could direct this if you want. Casting would let you direct this. Uh, and, uh, and they would pay me like five grand or something. I don't even remember. And, uh, and, and I said, oh, but I can't, like, if I did that, I'd have to <laughs> quit my job, which, uh, you know, and I was down yeah. to almost no money. And it was like, this here, here's some, suddenly there's a possibility of making of me directing a movie, which was all I've ever wanted to do since I was 12. Yeah. And I started thinking about it and, and thought about all of the, um, all of the parties I'd been to, the live action parties I'd been to, it all, all felt very, uh, very Hollywood. And there was a lot of sort of um, desperation in them a, a lot of times because right. everybody was trying to, you know, everybody's Everyone trying to, to, to get up a ladder right. there. And uh, and the parties that I'd been to at, in animation were just a bunch of people getting together and having fun and talking about movies or whatever it is that was going on in their lives. And, uh, and it was just a much more relaxed. People were just like, no, this is what I want to do. I just want to do animation. I just want to make animated cartoons. I want to make entertainment. And I suddenly felt like, oh, I think these are my peeps. I think this is where I belong. I love that. And, and, it's, and also it's easier to, to demonstrate to someone who doesn't actually draw that you can draw because people see a drawing. And even if they can't draw, they, they go, that's a good drawing. Yeah. Plus – those same people don't think if I tried to draw, I could draw. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. But but if you give someone a script, a they don't necessarily know no. if it's a good script or bad right. script when they read it. That's a talent. That's and a skill. And most of them think I could write if I if I put sat yeah. down and like I just don't feel like writing because they can spell. And, exactly. Uh, I can and read a book. Yes. I know how to read a menu. I can. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. No. It's uh, it's it's a uh, it's a very different thing. And it's just easier for me to get that work because I could draw so well. And um, and so I went around doing that and then uh, ended up on uh, Rocco's Modern Life at Nickelodeon where they wanted people who could write and draw. And I had to uh, – and, uh, and my buddy Swampy, who and we ended up making Phineas and Ferb together, um, said uh, – said you, you should go and, and, and show these the, the, the you know like the, the, these, these people are hiring you should go and show them your comic strip and so I showed them my comic strip I just I, I, I'd done a comic strip at USC mm-hmm. daily for six years or something like that I was only there for two years but they could continue to pay me to do the strip for uh, for a while afterward and uh, and I'd made books of them and I just brought a book in and cool. and so he, he said, yeah, we're looking for people who can write and draw. And I gave it to him and, he, and uh, the supervising director looked through and and he laughed at like the first five strips. And then he said, all right, you're hired. It was the easiest job interview oh, I'd ever had. Amazing. But that gave me a writing credit and, and, and uh, really turned me into a, 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 you know, a writer on TV. And then from there, I, I started doing writing gigs and uh, and storyboarding gigs and directing gigs and and sometimes all three. 
at the same time. Wow. And, uh, and just, uh, I started feeling like this is where, this is where I belong. And then I sold Phineas and Ferb, uh, you know, and it took like 13 years. Swampy and I actually created that show when we were working on Rocco's Modern Life. <laughs> wow. And then it took 13 years to sell it. 13 years? That show was a hit. Yeah, it was a, it was it was an overnight hit after 13 years of trying to get it Holy sold. Holy moly. Why was it so, so difficult to get a, it sold? It's a complicated show. It was well, it's two things. It's a very complicated show. There's sort of all these things happening at the same time that are their own storylines and 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 coming together uh at the end. And and uh but I think the most important thing, which is the, the sort of the saddest thing is it's really not about the show when you when you sell a show, it's about convincing a studio to spend a lot of money putting you in charge of a show. So it's yeah. really about you. It's okay. it's about who you are at that moment. Okay. And by that time, I had I had uh, worked my way up the echelons at uh, Fox, and I was I was a, a director on Family Guy and storyboard supervisor. So I so I was I was the the like. Seth used to call me the thirteenth rider, because because uh, he would say, "Well, we're, we're just going to punt this one to Pavanmeyer because because uh, they would need a bunch of visual gags of of, of something." And right. it was like, "We can sit here and think of a bunch of them, but and Dan's not going to pay attention to that anyway. <laughs> do whatever he wants. So let's just give it to Dan and say, I want a bunch of gags of democracy swe sweeping across Iraq, you know, mm -hmm. like, like that. And I would come, you know, he said, you got like two minutes of screen time to fill. And I would write all the, all the gags and draw them all. And, uh, um, and so he made this position for me so that I could take, I, I was not only directing my op own episodes, but I could cherry pick any sequence from anybody else's episode if I wanted to draw it. Oh, or okay. Seth would also cherry pick stuff that he was like, like the Shapoopy musical number, which is a big famous musical right. number in in, uh, in Family Guy. Seth, like that was in somebody else's episode, but he pulled that out and said, Dan, I want you to do this. And he just, oh, he, he, cool. he handed me this CD with this, Shapoopy song from uh, Music Man <laughs> on it with Peter singing it. And uh, and I remember just listening to in the car on the way home saying, oh, this is cool. Yeah, no, I know this musical number. This will, this will be fun. Oh, now there's a little dance break. Okay, that, that, that'll that be fun. I'll have to find, uh, I'll have to like choreograph that so it's interesting to watch. And then, oh, and it's coming back around again. And oh, the <laughs> dance break is still going. Okay, this is going to be a lot of work. Oh, and now the dance break is still going. It was like this forty-five second dance break right. that you never see, and it's like the entire dance break from the the actual Shapoopy <laughs> song. And I was like, and I, by the time I got home, I was like really exhilarated and really terrified at the same time because <laughs> I was like, like this is going to really be hard to fill this in a way that continues to be funnier because you know you you, you put those together, you, they're visual gags. Right, you, right, right. It needs to be more fun and more exciting the more you go. And I was like, how am I going to structure this so that this this is this is really fun? Uh, but I knew that if I did it right, it would be really remembered, fondly remembered. And when we when I did the animatic for it, uh, uh, the, the 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 writers always take the animatics and go back into the writers room and and start going through and saying what they can they can uh, you know punch up the scene i think we can do something more with this and stuff like right. that and apparently when it got to the musical number danny smith one of the writers stood up and said we are not touching one <laughs> freaking frame of this masterpiece or something <laughs> like that and i said agreed when they just moved, moved cool. on. Thank, thank, thanks. but uh you know it's one of my favorite things that i did there which uh, which is fun but because i had that position because seth had put me in this position of just sort of being that guy, suddenly I was somebody that they really wanted to be in business with, That's and awesome. uh, and they uh, and they said yes, let's let's do Phineas and Ferb with this guy, and uh, and because all of the executives were watching Family Guy at the time, so so I think the fact that I was that guy on Family Guy is why I got Phineas and Ferb sold. I think you know, wow. I, th I think that's what. That's what the 13 years were, was get, waiting till I became of somebody that they that wanted moment. to, you know, do a show with. Took 13 years for me to get my childhood. <laughs> yes, that's <laughs> exactly right. Because I remember. Yes. If we had done it earlier, it would have been somebody else's no, childhood. No, no, it was meant to be yes. for my childhood. <laughs> like, good. I remember coming home from school and just watching it. Like, some of the musical numbers 
still to this day. Like, obviously, like, the Candace squirrel in my pants was trending really hard on yeah, TikTok. Yeah. But even beside, like, trending on social media, so many of the musical numbers, like, still, I'll sing around my house or whatever. Yeah. It's one of those tunes from when I was younger that just never left my soul. Yeah. So, so people often ask, how do you and Swampy write such catchy, catchy yes. songs? And I said, well, it's because we're only trying to write catchy songs. We're, we're, we're not trying to get our inner angst out. We're no, just no, no, no. We're, we're we're you know playing the guitar until a a pop hook hits <laughs> hits uh, hits us, and we only have about an hour to do it. Yeah. So like the you know it's like, like um, I've always been pretty good at coming up with something that's that is somewhat memorable musically, right. and uh, and so so I've I've written like. 500 600 songs for Disney. Holy at this point, moly. Which is a little exhausting to think. That's that's a big number. It's a big number. People will be you know like, "Hey, here's a guitar, Dan. Can you sing some song that you wrote for for Phineas?" And I'm always like, you know, like I'm getting stumped by my own songs <laughs> constantly because you know, I I had to like play it on the guitar once you know, all the way through yeah, yeah, yeah. 15 years ago in a you know Good office while. in the Frank G Wells building on at, at Disney and uh I never had to play it again so I would have to like you know I might be able to figure it out pretty quick but uh, but I would have to figure it out right. as though it's somebody else's song so if you had to so. pick one song that's your absolute favorite Ooh. like your go to one that you still to this day are like yeah that was good Oh, there's, uh, you know, I think that Gitchy Gitchy Goo is about as good a pop song. I love that. I as, was just thinking you know, of that song in my head it's, five seconds it's, ago. It's, it's very simple, but it's just infectious. And you, it and you, is. You hear it. I like Gitchy Gitchy Goo. I like Busted. I like... Uh, uh, um, the I Happy like Birthday one from Candace. The, that one? Mom, It's Your Birthday. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that, that that was mostly Martin Olson who oh. who, who, who wrote that. The, the songwriting, you know, was a, certainly first season was a lot of me and Swampy, but also Martin Olson, who's a, a musician and a, mm -hmm. and a writer on the show, and John Barry and Rob Hughes. People, other people would jump in who are also musicians on, on, right. on the thing. Uh, but um, uh, but my favorite song may be Summer Belongs to You. I think that may be the oh, best that's a good one. song that I wrote for that show. And that was this magical songwriting session where where um uh where we were trying to we were like like the, we would usually Swampy would be writing a bunch of rhymes out, mm -hmm. little rhyming couplets that were in the, you know, like, like around the, the, the story that we were telling at the time while Martin and I would work, work out what the chorus melody, what would be, or sometimes we would work in like, okay, we need to build to a chorus. So, you know, we want to do something that's sort of like the structure of this kind of song or this kind of a song. And we would figure out what that was. And we really wanted this to be the big number at the end of our first hour long special. So we had this like, oh, and then what if it goes to F sharp minor here? And then it builds to, it comes up here and then we like, and it'll, it, it'll, it will sort of change modes into this thing and we can move up to this thing. And we, we had some, like some lyrics that we were, that, that we were fit, fitting in there as we were going, but we didn't have a chorus yet. And when we finally got those chords building up to where the chorus should be, we we literally just started singing. I, like, like we got it up, up to the the. I think it goes to an E chord on the on, on the chorus, and I was just like, "Summer belongs to you," and they and they started answering back or like this, "Summer belongs," and we sang the whole chorus the first time through together. And then we hooted and hollered and jumped around the place because it just like, oh my God, that it chorus came perfect. came out perfectly the first time. And we just like, let's write that down really quick before you Don't did it. Forget we just like, it. I, it was uh and I think that's that's as good a song as I've ever written. I love that. That's really so fun. cute. So then what has been your most like your most prideful moment? Like the thing that you were the most proud of because you've had a very successful yeah. career. What is the one thing that stands out as that is the most I can't the proudest I've ever yeah, been yeah, the of myself? Yeah, yeah, the proudest you've ever been. Um, they did at – I'm going to tell you a story and then I'm going to cry. That's <laughs> okay. Like, I'm here for it's it. The, it's the, the most um, – it makes me tear up every time. Um, That's good. It's you know, good I grew up going to Disneyland a lot. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, because my my parents were from. from uh, uh, I was born in San Diego, and so we'd come out and visit my cousins and my grandparents uh, every year, and then we'd go up to Disneyland usually, like that. And it was just always this magical, wonderful place. And then you know, going to school out here, we'd go in college and and stuff like that. And when I, th there was a time where where we were making the first Phineas movie and the show at the same time and all these ancillary things and doing things like throwing out the first pitch at Dodger Stadium and, 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 and you know, getting interviewed by the New York Times and the LA Times at the same time. You know, like Phineas was like this big swell of success yeah. there. And in the middle of that, the, um, the Parks people uh, uh, pitched us this thing that they wanted to do with, with this Phineas and Ferb dance party at California Adventure. And they they already had the the, the big heads the the uh, the walk arounds is what they call them the big headed characters that's the, that we you know walk around the parks they already made those for that's Phineas and Ferb so cool. which was a cool thing in and of itself yeah. right um, and they were going to do this dance party that just would happen out in the streets in front of the the, the Little Mermaid um, and uh, and they you know and they and we approved the the songs they were going to do. We we approved the design of the of the fireside girls costumes that the dancers would have, and we we approved the design of the sh of the this truck that came out that uh, that you know transported them out there and stuff. And then they said, okay, we're going to go and, and choreograph it and stuff. We'll let you know when it's when, when it's ready. And I was the busiest I've ever been, and I got an email saying saying, uh, hey, uh, the the show is up and running at uh, at California Adventure, so next time you're there, you should check it out. And I was like, okay, cool. And I just and then I moved on to whatever else was happening. Right. And completely forgot about that email. Just left my mind entirely. And like a month later, I'm there at California Adventure with my daughters who are like, you know, who, who are old enough. They know all those songs. Right. Uh, the, you know, they, they, they watched every episode as soon as I got like a, I could bring a DVD of the finished episode Aww. home. So they got to see it before the rest of America, before the rest of the world. And, uh, and it was just like, it was such a, like a indelible part of all of our lives at that time, and uh, and and we're walking around California Adventure, and I suddenly go, wait, I think I got an email. I wonder if that's up and ready. Like, like, like I, I suddenly remembered this email. I was like, that can't be. And I went over and I asked him, is there, um, and it's a silly question, but is there any kind of a Phineas and Ferb, like, show that happens here and they say oh yeah it's Phineas and Ferb's dance but rock and dance party is right over there uh it's and it starts in about 15 minutes and I was like oh and I didn't tell my kids and I didn't tell my wife see I'm gonna cry <laughs> it's, it's, if you clear um, your throat it'll bring uh, you two ducks I learned that life happens. Uh, um so it works <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so I dragged them over there and the girls are like I, we want to go to Big Thunder Mountain, you know, you know like or or, or the, the Grizzly Rapids. That's what they wanted to do. And it's like, like I think we should. Say, there's going to be something yeah. here you guys are going to like, you know. And they're like, Dad, when's it going to start? It's hot and stuff like that. It's like you know, it'll be worth it. Just, and my like, wife is looking around because there's already people lined up for it. There's already people lined up for it, and they're all wearing Phineas shirts. And one of this little girl has a homemade Fireside Girl costume on, oh my and there's someone got Perry the Platypuses and stuff like that. And my wife's looking around. She's like, Honey. What is this? And I said, Shh, you're gonna like, you're gonna like it. You're like, like, and my daughter's like, Dad, I want to wait. Dad, Dad, do you hear that? Do you hear that? And it was the Phineas and Ferb. Oh. <laughs> and uh, and they came around the corner and they uh, they sung all these songs. And they did all this dancing and stuff like that, and, and uh, it was oh. the most magical moment. I bet your girls are so proud of you. Oh, please cut out all of this and me crying. <laughs> they are <laughs> like they seriously but, are your biggest fans. Yeah, no, They're it was great. Um, uh, it was really great because it was like all of the hard work that I'd put in, and I I worked ridiculous hours. Oh, absolutely, of, of Phineas, because I really wanted to make it as good as I could. Right, possibly. like I you wanted, love that project. I wanted you to change Phineas. the demographic of Disney Channel, right? You know, because I'd been there when. When SpongeBob changed the demographic of Nickelodeon, exactly. the Simpsons changed the dem demographic. I felt like that's the high water mark. That's what I should be shooting for. And then we did. Yeah. And then that happened. And and I'm at that magical place. And and you know and my show and my songs are, are part of that magic. That's amazing. and that was cool. And so like I just sat there and and 
cried like a baby and held my wife and we were just crying. and the girls got up and danced with them and stuff like that because they teach you the choreography and stuff That's like that so it was uh it was really really the probably the the biggest moment of my career I love and there've been that. a lot of really cool big moments since Phineas took off what I love the most about that story is like I think there's so many people that would have you know, obviously, like, your your proudest moment is your proudest moment. But I love that yours is specifically, like, sharing it with the girls mm -hmm. and sharing it with your wife. Like, just sharing it with your family in general is just so special. Yeah, no. It, it was really cool. Um, while you're teary-eyed. Thanks for making me cry. Oh, I'm, gonna, I'm about to do it again. Okay. Because <laughs> you once told me a story that still makes me cry. Okay. You told me this story the first time we met. And I would, if you feel comfortable, like What's if you the don't, story? it's the story about your teacher. Oh, that one. That was, I still cry. Yeah, I repeat that was, it to my that was mom. when I when I got that the the, the gig doing both of those things. Uh, I, I got the gig. Uh, I'd been out of work for a while, and then suddenly I got this gig, drawing on The Simpsons and writing this slasher movie, and mm -hmm. I felt like like I'm I'm drawing. I'm working on a a big hit show, right? And I'm actually writing a movie that's going to get made, right? This feels like the beginning of a career. Right. And for some reason, I thought back to um, growing up in Alabama and how none of there, there was never an adult in my life during that time other than my parents. My parents were very supportive. And for that, I'm very lucky because a lot of right, my right. colleagues were not as lucky as having their Absolutely. parents say, yes, I think you can do, you can do this. But there was not an adult in my life ex uh, that ever said, I think you can make a living doing this. Doing art. Do, doing, doing art, doing creative stuff, because that was just unheard of in Alabama. Yeah. And a lot of them would say, you know, there's a reason they call them starving artists. It's because they're starving, which was like a, a, a fun little yeah. chestnut. And uh, But one day in my, in my uh, social studies class, I had this teacher, Mr. Mitchell, who, uh, who I really liked. He was, he, was, he was a lot of fun. He came to the Rocky Horror Picture Show to uh, like one night to see it because we were all singing songs for the Rocky Horror Picture Show. What is this thing you guys keep doing? And we told him <laughs> he actually came out to a midnight show to hang out with his, you know, Steve. his students just yeah. to see what was going on. It like really like, really like broke his brain, but but it was just nice of him to 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 come right. out. He we cared. Were like, we were, like, we he cheered really cared. when he showed up and stuff. And uh, but it was the eleventh grade, and he was asking people in the in the uh, in the class like just w what you wanted to do when you when you left school what what do you want to study what do you want to become what job do you see yourself having and i said i want to go out to california and i want to make movies i want to be you know in the entertainment industry and somebody in the ca in the in the back of the class snickered like <laughs> like that and I, and, uh, sure. and he said hey what's wrong with you I think Pavenmeyer's funny. You don't think Pavenmeyer's funny? If there's anybody in this class who can do that, it's it's Pavenmeyer. And and they just shut up about it immediately. And uh and I was like, wow, that's the first adult to ever th tell me that he that he he thought that I could do that. And uh and I thought about that when I got those jobs and I felt like this feels like the beginning of a career. And in retrospect, that was the beginning of my career. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and we're not even to the best part. I know. It's like we're, we're pre crying. This. <laughs> uh, this is like, I didn't think I was going to come on your show and cry about it. Um, <laughs> but uh, do we have Kleenex here? <laughs> Chuck like, Carrot, Rebecca hurt my feelings. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, but uh, so. So I thought about that when I when 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 I got this sort of career defining moment, and uh, and I I said I need to tell Mr. Mitchell that this is happening for me, and so I called information and got his his number and I called up and I got his wife and I says Mr. M Mitchell there and she said oh no Dan and I'd met his wife before and she knew who I was and and. Uh, it's no, oh no, Dan. Uh, he um, he's in the hospital right now for for back problems, and I was like, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Is um, if I wrote a letter to him and sent it to you, would you take it into him? And she said, yeah, absolutely, I, I, I will do that. And so I went and bought an envelope, I, like a box of envelopes, but I didn't have an envelope, so and and like I had stamps because I was always paying bills, and like I got a piece of paper and I hand wrote out a note telling him. You know, like reminding him of that moment when he when he gave me this vote of confidence, yeah, and and telling him what was going on in my career right now and how I might not 
be at that point if he hadn't given me that 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 vote of confidence and i s sent it to his wife and and then i didn't hear anything for like six months or something and then he calls me one day and i, I answer the phone and he says uh, Dan Poffenmeyer, this is Jim Mitchell. And I said, well, hi, Mr. Mitchell. How you doing? He's like, you know, I'm doing really good, and I just wanted to call you and tell you. <laughs> clear your throat, clear your throat. Damn. He said, uh, he said, I just wanted to tell you that you saved my life. And, and I'm like, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm trying so hard not to cry. And I said, really? Why? How did I do that? Do that? And he said, well, when my wife told you I was in the in the in the hospital for back problems, that was a lie of sorts. What uh, I had, what you guys in California refer to as a nervous breakdown. He had been hospitalized for depression. He felt like he had never made a difference in his students' lives, and, and he was at the lowest point in his entire life. And and at that moment is when his wife came in and handed him this letter from me. Telling him what a difference he had made in my life. And that's amazing. And I know that that is somehow why I wrote that letter, that he needed to see it because I wasn't a big letter writer. I had to go buy an envelope. You know, it's like, yeah. like uh, that was maybe one personal letter I wrote that whole year. And uh, and I just feel like somehow I, I you know, the universe or whatever, yeah. God, yeah. whatever it was saying – saying, I think you should tell Mr. Mitchell what's going on with you right now. I think that will help him. Everything and, happens uh, for a reason. Yeah, and that's uh, that's what I did, and I'm so glad I did. So, you know, you know, everybody out there, if, if you have something to say to your teachers or anybody who's made a difference in your lives, uh, you should Sometimes you should I need them. to hear it. Yeah, you and never I, know you never know who's going through what. I just like you you told me that story almost a year ago at this yeah. point. It's been it was the first time we ever we ever met. Oh yeah, when you got when you and Kara came over. Yes. Yeah. And that story, like I thought about that constantly for like a week. Oh. Um because you know I used to teach yeah. high school social studies yeah. and I just now I'm crying. <laughs> This was not the show we were planning <laughs> on making. That. I, didn't know <laughs> this was, I thought this was going to be funny. I tried twice. <laughs> this is going to be a funny episode. Nope, this is the sad one. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't done a sad one yet. Um, but I, you know, I just, I related to that so hard yeah. because there have been lots of kids that I would stay up at night thinking about and worrying about their safety and do mm. they have food tonight? Do they have, are they safe tonight? Yeah. And you know, there, there are kids that I still worry about. I've been out of the classroom for a year and a half at this point yeah. there. I still worry about some of those kids mm. and there's always that underlying feeling of, did I do enough? Like will any of these kids even remember like I'm, I'm still here two years later worrying yeah. about their safety. Like, are they going to remember that I cared about them or yeah. loved them? And so, yeah, like, all of your that, kids will remember your, your you. As <laughs> well, just just hearing that was just so powerful for me. Yeah. God, no, I'm, I'm crying <laughs> so hard. <laughs> <clears throat> You're the one who asked the question. I know. I, I, I thought I was, I was stronger. I was than willing this. to skirt around that. <laughs> I thought I was stronger. I didn't think that I would cry. <laughs> um, and I. We can edit this out. <laughs> no, <laughs> so, no, it's perfect. Yeah. But I think I think it just goes to show that like people in general just sometimes you don't realize the the impact that you have in someone's yeah. life, like. Your your teacher had no idea how helpful he was to even one of his students. And, yeah. like, it really just takes one to really know that you made a difference. And, yeah. like, you made a difference in my childhood. Yeah. Like, I think that just everyday interactions, just people living their own lives. Yeah. Like, you don't realize how much just being yourself impacts people and can change someone's day, whether it's as small as, you know, just standing like, hey, I believe in this student. Like, yeah, and that's just such a simple thing. Like, all teachers should, you know, stand yeah. up for their kids in what they want to do in life, in their dreams. Like, it should be pretty simple to just say, yeah, I think you can do that. I think you're capable. And even just something as small as, like, I always try when I'm out in public and I, whether I'm talking to a cashier or a barista or anyone, like, smiling, have a good day, ask them about their day kind of thing. Because you just never know the small interactions that you have with someone, 
how that can change someone's day, how that can create a moment that is big for them. You know, I just feel like people don't realize how powerful those small, simple moments can be, whether it's someone that is prominent in your life, just a random stranger, like it doesn't really matter, you know, and that's important. Yeah. And now I have to ask you like a fun question okay, because now I have one. to get out of this teary Let's get out of this funk. <laughs> okay, so you are... But it's not sad. It's We're not crying sad. because it's a the, good, that's a very happy it's story. A, they're and, very and, happy story. Know. Like both of them are yeah. just, they're just so that's, powerful yeah. and like they matter. They really do matter. And they're, yeah. it's, it's like life-changing moments. And I think that when people look at, you know, you are a very successful Hollywood professional and sometimes it can be hard to see people in your position as people like even content creators people like put these individuals on pedestals and sometimes people forget that content creators celebrities like they are people yeah. with very real emotions yeah. and very real moments and like you're a very down to earth human being and i feel like a lot of people would just assume that you weren't just because like you don't have I to. Because seem be. so aloof on TikTok. Well, like, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, just so stuck up in general. But, like, you don't have to be. Yeah. You know, like, you're someone who is so successful and done so much that you really don't have to be a good person, but you just no. are, you know? What, what, uh, what fame and success does is it takes away the, uh, the social, um, influence for you to be good and uh, you know so so it it allows you to be whoever you really are i love that and there's a lot of people who are really good people yeah and they get successful and they just stay good people there's people who who would get away with stuff if they could those people are going to get away with a lot more yeah. if they don't have people telling them not to do it because the, because they're that makes they're sense. famous or they're, they're successful. So like obviously so. we we don't we don't want to put anyone down like we don't right. we don't like that. So are there any people in Hollywood that stand out to you as just genuinely good human beings that oh, you're like yeah. I love this person? Yeah, they tons. are just one of the tons best humans. And tons. Okay, like most of the voice actors I I, I know. Dietrich Bader is one of my favorite people on the on, on the planet. Kate Micucci is is just wonderful. Like, there's a lot of people who are just genuinely nice, wonderful people that. That, that 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 you just want to, uh, you know, that you can just hang out with, and and uh, um, you know, the, the, there's a there's a lot of great people. The the, the cast of Hamster and Gretel. Uh, we all went to Comic Con together, mm -hmm. and I just felt like I just want to hang out with these people all the time. Michael Cimino, oh. Liza Koshy, Carolina Ravasa, Joanna, and me, uh, and uh, and Brock, Bro Brock Powell. It, like we had just the best day all day, and 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 to me, it was very special because because my daughter Melly was the first time she went and did like a big press event and she was very nervous about it. She's sort of an introvert. She does great in front of a big crowd of people, but, uh, but you know, she, she's exhausted by that right. kind of social yeah. interaction. And one of the people there was, uh, was Liza Koshy, who she's a huge fan of Liza yeah. Koshy. And, uh, and like when Liza showed up in the, in the hotel lobby, she was, she was like, Oh my God, Dad! Liza Koshy, she's right behind me, right? You like that? And I, I said, "Let me introduce you." And I introduced oh. you, and they were like best friends within about ten minutes because Liza is the most down to earth, wonderful person you, oh, would, wanna, you would want to be around. And we just spent all weekend, you know, going to parties together and 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 being interviewed by people like in different places and stuff like that. And and it was like I would hang out with these people anywhere that's amazing and you know and joanna was like our cast just loves each other it's like, oh. you know it really felt so quickly like a family yeah that uh you know i i, I love all those people They're i think that's one of like the cool things about and again I, being a content creator is not the same thing at all as being like a hollywood person or yeah. a celebrity but i know that like on a content creator level it's really awesome getting to see people on like on my phone and then meeting them and realizing like oh you really are the same in person that's like yes. the best feeling ever and i've met so many content creators at your house that i've been able yes. to do that with and i think 
That's, 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 that's where content creators hang out. Yeah, that's, that's the, the cool hangout house is Dan's house. But like, really, I do have parties where there's a yeah, lot of content creators. I, it's there, fun. Yes. And it's just it's a, it's a place where people can just hang out. And you know that if people are going to go, that they're good people. Like, they're yeah. decent people. And I think that's what can kind of be really intimidating when, like, trying to pick your favorite Hollywood stars or celebrities of, like, you never really know, like – are they just as awesome in, in person? Because I really just yes. want them to be nice people. And yeah, they always say, don't meet your heroes. Yes. But sometimes your heroes are great. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes, I sometimes like your that. heroes are great. So yeah. Sometimes they're like, okay, I might not hang out with them. Yeah, <laughs> but, well, like, that's just like people in general, but, you know? Uh, like, but, uh, yeah, I, I find that most of the time, people who just want to create for a living and aren't trying to, you know, Aren't trying to just be famous to get yeah. something out of being fa famous. People who like, just like want to entertain, yeah, are really genuinely good people. I think that they're 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 just trying to share themselves in in that way, and and you know like like so many of my friends now, it's weird at this age because I've got all my friends from my age that are like in their fifties, mm -hmm. and then uh, or you know late forties and 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 fifties. And then there's this big gap, and then I have all these friends who are content creators <laughs> who like, 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 you know, I've thrown parties at my house where I am by 20 years the oldest person there. No, you no, know? no. You're, like, and here you're our, you're our age. We're yes, the same age, I know, Dan. I, I seem that age to some people, but uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's like, and I have so much in common with them that it doesn't feel right. weird for, you know, for me to be hanging out with the It's not weird. With them. We're but, good buddies. But I'm just like, you know, oh, I'm going to get a bunch of people together. Yeah. And also the content creators are the ones that don't have families yet and stuff like that. Yeah. So they'll actually show up to the parties. Yeah. You know, if I Absolutely. if I'm texting my friends who are in their their forties and fifties, they've got they've got to deal with where their children are at this time and, yeah. and, and yeah. stuff like that. So less of them may come. So a lot of times I end up with mostly just you know these. I didn't these think young about people. that. But there's also a lot of energy in that, and and the, and the fact that we're all doing the same thing. We're all trying to right. to to just create stuff and put it out there and see yes. see see how it goes. And that's always what I've been doing. It's just more immediate on yeah. TikTok. Well, I guess the the difference also with the content creators is that you know when you do content creation, it's really like you yourself in in your yeah. room, and it can be really isolating. And so, like being able to have those get-togethers at your house really do mean so much because yeah. it forces people to go outside and yes. socialize and make friends. Because you know we don't have coworkers the same way you right. know like other exactly. content creators i guess could be seen as like colleagues yeah but that's that's really sometimes some of the only socialization some of them have is getting yeah. to like go meet people at yeah. your house yeah well i mean th th there's a couple different places uh, ben has a get together writers, like on wednesdays when yeah, you know like yeah. where everybody just comes over and hangs out there and it's just sort of a place for people to work and hang out and stuff like that and i try you know i try to get together with people on a, on a pretty regular basis and just have people I love over. That. Avery's and, still waiting for you to go play pickleball this week. We'll have to figure out a time we can do that because <laughs> I'll do that. But I'm not on Avery's level. That's okay. That's all right. <laughs> I, from That's what okay. I hear, nobody's really on Avery's level. <laughs> Avery's if, if you want to play ping pong, coach. we might be a little more evenly matched. I'll play we'll ping see. pong with all you. Right. Yeah, yeah, I'll watch. I'm really good at like watching okay. pickleball and yes. like cheering on on the sidelines. Okay. I always get asked, "Will you play?" I'm like, I don't like to run. If I'm running like freely, yeah. someone should like make sure no one's chasing me. You might also want to run. Like <laughs> I'm just, I don't, I'm not I interested. I understand. So some a question that I got a lot when like. Because obviously on Instagram, I've been teasing the the podcast and episodes. And so I mentioned that I was going to do one on Hollywood. And of course, my followers are like, oh, it's Dan because they know we're friends. Yes. And one of the questions that I keep getting is, in your own opinion, when it comes to Hollywood, do you think it's still possible for people to make it on their own? Or do you think nowadays people like need a connection or it's not going to – it's just become so saturated and clicky. I think it is clicky. much more possible for you to make it on your own now really? than it has ever been just because of social media. Okay, okay. Like, 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 like I think – I think my band that I was in for 16 years would have been huge – if we'd had social media at the time, because because we because we we like we had this huge following in L.A. just on our own without like a manager or anything. No, you were in a band. I was in a band for sixteen years. We we What'd both you play? A, uh, wrote guitar. We were okay. we were we were sort of like, but we were 
the thing that nobody wanted, nobody felt like they could sell because everybody was looking for the next Nirvana or Pearl Jam. Got and it. we were not that. We were not an <laughs> angsty band at all. We were like a really fun, crunchy pop band that had serious songs and sweet uh, songs and and dancing, you know, l- yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah. like get up at a party so- songs and funny songs. And, you know, like like we, we, we were sort of, Bare Naked Ladies before Bare Naked Ladies. <laughs> and everybody was looking for the next Pearl Jam. Right, right. right. And we would, we would, you know, like fill a club on a Wednesday night. We'd fill club laundry on a Wednesday night. And then people would still say, yeah, but I don't know, I, don't, I can't sell you. It's like, Lame. really? Did you look at the 200 Lame. people we brought in on a, uh, on they a Wednesday? They missed out. They and, missed uh, out. And uh, so, you know, I, I should probably release those albums now. On, yeah, you on, should. On Absolutely. We had one song that got a lot of airplay in different markets around the town, but we didn't send it there at all. It was just people who had bought the CD had handed it and handed it and handed it, you know, and, and, and so, so cool. I would get I would get checks from BMI that said like, oh, some radio station in – Illinois played it 200 times last Oh, last my month. gosh. Uh, but, uh, um, but like, if we had had a way of getting it out to the people at the time, that's why so many musical acts are breaking on t- on, on TikTok and, uh, and Instagram and, so, and, cool. and stuff like that because they're able to get it out to people and people are responding. If you, a good song is a good song. And, I mean, the songs in, in our band were as good as anything I've written in – in Phineas and Ferb, you know, cool. it's like we we they were fun, catchy, uh, you know, uh, fun, crunchy pop band stuff. Okay. So. And then, do you think another question? The band was called Keep Left. Keep Left. Okay, I'm gonna if, have if you, any of you remember it. I'm gonna have you like show me some of those songs. Okay, I, I, I want to see I, those sometime. This I think week. I yeah. I, I'll if you come over, I'll give you a CD. Okay, I would love that. But you, I, I, that. I don't know if you have anything to play a CD. On. I have a CD player. Okay. okay. Yeah. Then, yeah. 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 I got I have one a CD of those. Player. I, okay. I have a CD for you. you oh, I'm so excited. Like okay. Yeah, I want it. Another question that I got is: okay. Do you think there are any general misconceptions about Hollywood. Any that come to your mind that you're like, oh, every, this is a big myth or this is what everyone thinks? I think there's lots of little misconceptions okay. about Hollywood. I think, uh, uh, you know, people people just have, people just don't know anything about the mechanics of how things work. People, are, people ask me like, you know, why don't you just make more Phineas and Ferb? Which we are now actually making more Phineas and Ferb. Oh! But it was not my decision. Right, right, right. You know, There's like, a whole like, team that's like, got to like, decide I can't just go, that. hey, let, we're just going to start making more Phineas and <laughs> hey, Ferb. Like, Disney. No, there's like a way. big machine <laughs> that that has to get involved. Or why right, did right. you stop making Milo Murphy's Law? I was like, I would still be making <laughs> Milo Murphy's Law if it was up to me. Right. Uh, I loved that show. Uh, it just didn't get the ratings, you right, know? Right. And and I can't just make the show in a vacuum. I na- need, need a research. studio to give yeah. me millions of dollars to to spend on making making right. the show. It's a it's an expensive proposition. Uh, people don't understand that sort of stuff a lot. There's a lot of stuff that people don't understand. I'm trying to think what a misconception of uh, of Hollywood is, and I I, th- I think it's that that's a harder thing to to think okay. of. If I, if I saw one, I go, yeah, that's not the way, way it okay, really works okay. here. But a lot of people like will make up in their mind how things happen. Oh yeah, and it's and it's, it's not, not like it's that at all. It's just not that way. There's this this conception of, like you can just get a script to the, you know if you throw the script over somebody's transom and they'll and and they'll pick it up and the, it'll make you. Fa- it's like that stuff almost never happens. But that being said. <laughs> Uh, a, a young songwriter friend of mine uh, and uh, and her partner uh, got to go on tour with KT Tunstall, the the, the one who did uh, Black Black Horse and the Cherry Tree. Oh wow! And and I was like, how did you get that gig? Because I know people who know KT, and I thought, and they know them, and I thought like a Swampy knows KT because he's worked with her before, and, and I was like, did Swampy get that for you? Because he, he you know he also knew Madison. And uh, and I was, and she was like, no, it's the most weird, corniest <laughs> story that like that's so weirdly Americana that you can't even imagine it because because uh, uh, Maddie, the 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 singer of uh, Maddie Ross, uh, like commented on one of Katie St- Tunstall's things and said, or or she 
put something up saying KT was one of her biggest influences. And KT saw it on Instagram because she followed, looked at her mentions and she went and, f and listened to some of her music. And like, oh my God, this girl's really good, you know? And That's so cool. And she just called her up and said, do you want to go on tour with me and open up? And it was like their first tour ever. It was That's like, amazing. and they toured all over the country, follow, you, you know, opening up for, for KT. Right. And, it, you know, it's like, that doesn't really happen, but occasionally it, yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's sort of what keeps that myth going is occasionally you'll hear stories like that because it can, it can happen. Right. There's nothing that says it but can't. But it's not, it's not but as that's common not as the way it, it works. That's not really the way it works. So. It, that's so that's cool. Good cool. for her. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Really cool. Well, then, are there any last minute Words of wisdoms or thoughts that you would want to leave our listeners with before oh, we head out. You know, um, I here here's my my thought, especially to young people who might who might be be watching, is the uh, if you're uh, if you're doing something you love for a living, it will whatever money you're making will always be enough. If you're doing something you hate for a living, if that's how you're making money doesn't matter how much they're paying you it will never be enough because it will you'll just you know I, I think the biggest path to success is to find something that you would do for free and then figure out a way to make a living doing that and that's the, the, the that's the the best path to success because you will work the hardest at it and it's also the best ha path to happiness. I feel like I have a really, really great life because yeah. everything that I do for a living, if if I was if I was unemployed right now, I'd be sitting around with my friends and talking in silly voices and writing silly songs and and uh, and drawing silly cartoons and telling stupid stories, and those are all the things that I get paid to do now, and uh, and I I find that to be just so. Surreal. Yeah, so surreal that, that that that's what I get to get to do for a living. So that. so follow your passion, follow the things that you you want to do. And I think that happiness will be the path to your door. That's amazing. Well, thank you so much for hanging out sure, with us tonight, Dan. Exactly. Thanks for coming. Uh, Thanks for being my friend. <laughs> and thank you guys so much for hanging out with us. I hope you didn't cry as much as we did. I wasn't <laughs> planning that. I really wasn't. But I hope, I really hope to see you guys again next weekend. Have a great rest of your day. Bye, my lovelies. Bye. Bye.